Hello, and welcome to lecture 10 of AMAT 502 at UAlbany. Today, we're going to introduce one of the most important packages in all of Python, and that's NumPy. Some people might say NumPy. Um, today, we're going to start as a focusing on the difference between NumPy and lists that are already built into Python, but I'm going to try to illustrate all the many packages that are built upon um, NumPy's basic implementation. So the topics for today are we're going to do a quick intro to the syntax for creating a NumPy array. We're going to see how this compares with lists and some of the ways in which you might try to do operations on lists, like list comprehension. Um, and then we'll get to see some of the really clever syntax that NumPy has. Um, I encourage you to experiment with the notebook as much as possible. Some of these go underneath the, the heading of vectorization of operations. That means that you sort of can exploit this array or vector-like structure um, in order to really streamline some computations. Um, and then finally, we'll end with some uh, importation from uh, the random library and uh, do, do some computations with random arrays. All right, so NumPy is a Python package that allows you to store and manipulate what's called homogeneous arrays of data. In contrast to pandas, which is going to be our main uh, object when we get into machine learning, um, you need every entry in a NumPy array to have the same type. That's what homogeneous means. It means it's of the same type. Um, so this means that, in some sense, NumPy is less flexible than, than, list, than Python's built-in lists because we really want all of the entries to be of the same type. We'll then go on to see how sort of paradoxically pandas, which is built on top of, of NumPy, um, uses the data frame structure instead of the NumPy array in order to deal with what's called heterogeneous data. So this is data where the entries can be names and numbers and all sorts of different types. So you might ask yourself, why do we need NumPy? I mean, after all, we already have lists, so why do we need NumPy's arrays? Well, the first story is that when we think about what's happening under the hood, meaning what's happening at the lowest level implementations of NumPy, essentially very clever programmers have figured out how to come up with optimal implementations of the array data structure, which makes it extremely uh, efficient for doing things which you need to do all the time. Like, how do you find the maximum entry in an array? Uh, of course, we have methods for doing that um, in using lists, um, but in general, there are very, very clever and thoughtful ways of accomplishing these tasks that need to be refined and optimized. Uh, um, another example um, is how might you search a, an array or a list for a particular entry? Um, we had that information that say the list was ordered, um, we were able to use bisection search, which you already saw was um, much faster than traditional linear search, where you march through linearly. Um, remember with bisection, sometimes called binary search, you cut your list in half and then you search on the left or the right, depending on whether or not the value you're looking for is smaller or larger. Essentially, NumPy has really efficient implementations for these things that operate under the hood. Um, additionally, as you probably are aware, uh, this concept of an array, of everything being a vector, is extremely important when doing any scientific computation. Um, we already saw last class when we tried to plot sine and cosine using matplotlib, we were faced with the fact that you can't actually represent the entire interval as a continuous set of reals. Um, instead, you have a sort of grid um, placement of points. Uh, we used the lin space function last time in order to plot these graphs. And that just deals with the fact that you can only sample so many, finitely many points on the real line, and then ask what the corresponding value is for each of those, val uh, each of those points when you apply a function like sine or cosine. Um, so arrays are really the fundamental data structure for so much scientific computing. Um, and so it's really important for all these things to be optimized. Uh, for those of you who've had experience with MATLAB, you'll know that 
one of the reasons MATLAB is so popular is that it has essentially very efficient implementations for the vectors that it uses. So a key takeaway is that NumPy is essentially Python's MATLAB. Additionally, NumPy is the basis for all these different packages. So if you, if you click on this link, it's gonna bring you up to uh, the NumPy uh, homepage. And you'll see how so many different things which are gonna be useful to any of you doing either scientific computing or data analysis are gonna need to use. You know, we have all these applications to astronomy, uh, AstroPy, SunPy, SpacePy, all this is built on NumPy. Um, additionally, Pandas and Stats Models and Seaborn, which are gonna be our ways of dealing with statistics and visualizing. Um, um, additionally, SciPy, this is for essentially dealing with scientific applications where you need to use um, you know, special functions, the gamma function. Um, all these things are gonna be important and all of these things are built on NumPy. Again, we're gonna use that term of, of ecosystem and as you click through, you'll see all these different arrays, data science. All this is built on the, uh, on the back of, uh, of NumPy. All right, so let's try to understand some of the basic syntax behind creation of a NumPy array. Again, hopefully everything working is working on our server as it should be. Um, so the first line you always need to include is to import NumPy. And traditionally we use the abbreviation NP as the uh, shorthand for NumPy. This allows us to use NP instead of saying NumPy to then retrieve some of the methods that are built into that library. Um, so in this particular method, we're gonna create an array um, and here we're gonna create an array with a list of entries um, and the first item of the list, another list, and so on. And so again, we're building on the built-in data type of a list inside of Python, but by passing it through this NumPy array operation, suddenly there's gonna be a lot of very delicate and interesting things that are happening behind the scenes that allow us to manipulate and work with A much faster. So let's go ahead and see how this works. Let's bring this into memory. All right, good. So, all right, so let's go ahead and create another array. So again, we can just pass it as a, as a list of lists. Um, and we'll make an array out of that. Um, and so again, just going back to what we had here, there's A, maybe we should call this B. Um, I could look at B and then I can also look at, let's say, A plus B. And it'll know to add these arrays entry by entry as, as if you were to stack them on top of each other and view these as matrices. This is already an example of a two-dimensional array. Um, right, and you might ask what happens when I just ask Python for what's the type of it. So again, by bringing in this library, we know that this is now a, an ND array, um, which is a special data type um, implemented by Python, by NumPy. All right, so we've already sort of alluded to what, what's going on here, but suppose I, I hand you uh, this list, one, two, three, but where I've separated every element in that list with another set of square brackets. Um, so this is a, a list of lists where each list inside of this list is has only one length. Um, so you, you might ask or wonder, what's the difference between when we write something this way or when we write something this way. Well, let's go ahead and look at how, how NumPy would, would treat these. Um, so if we run these, you'll see that in the first case, NumPy uh, turns that list of lists into what looks like a column vector. So this means that if you're just passed a single, a single list like we do here, np array one, two, three, then it treats it as a as an array or as a as a row vector and notice that in fact when we print just like we were doing with some of the 
object-oriented programming, we could overwrite the string method. It, it prints it as if it were a list. Um, and we know that now under the hood, that means there's probably some function which overrides the print the string method um, to handle the, the internal workings of this array. But let's let's continue to see where this uh, the advantages of NumPy are. All right, so let's go back to consider how we might do some basic operations with lists. So for, suppose we have a list of distances um, and we know that they travel over some period of time. Um, and the time is recorded in another list. So we have a list of distances and a list of times. You know, and we did this for 10 cars. So you can think of this as maybe uh, observing 10 cars that go by on the highway and then trying to see how far they go and in what period of time. So classic question would be, how would we calculate the speed for each car? So speed is, of course, you know, the absolute value of velocity. Um, and velocity, we can think of in this case as just um, being whatever our distance is viewed as an absolute quantity divided by the period of time. So distance divided by time. That's why we have miles per hour. Um, so let's go ahead and see how we do this. So I've made up a couple distances. We can think of these as miles. Um, and um, maybe we can think of these as minutes or hours. Doesn't really matter. So let's go ahead and bring those into memory. So we have distances, list of 10 distances, and list of 10 times. So one sort of cumbersome solution for finding out all these uh, speeds is to go ahead and iterate through our list of distances. You know, assume that we've given a list that's just as long, um, or at least longer, um, than the list of distances. And then we're just going to store this division operation entry by entry, which is going to give us a float, and then append that float to this growing list of speeds. All right, so that's how we would we might implement this using um, using a for loop. How else might we approach this? Well, you could also use list comprehension, and there are a couple ways in which we might try to do that. Um, I want to illustrate one way, which takes advantage of a function that we we haven't really talked much about in this class. Um, and this is called the zip function. So in general, the way that the zip function works is it takes in two iterable objects. So remember, iterable means it's something you can iterate over, and you can step through one item at a time. Um, and there are some examples of things like sets and so on, which were not iterable, but lists and tuples are certainly iterable. And so you can use the zip function to take in two iterable objects. Let's call it i1 and i2. And it's going to return another iterable of tuples. Of course, the way in which this is actually stored in the computer is going to be a little funny. It's kind of meant to be used as a, uh, as a crutch that is then passed along through computation. Uh, and in particular, one computation and one way in which it can be used as a crutch is in list comprehension. So let's look at the same example, trying to compute the speeds of 10 cars um, by using the zip function. All right, so, so what I'm gonna do is define pairs to be this zip of distances and times. Now, again, if you look here, it says it returns an iterable of tuples. So we know what a tuple is. A tuple is just like surrounded by round brackets, like x comma y, like in the x, y plane. So here we have distances comma time. And so we're gonna take in our two lists distances and times, and then we're gonna return this zip object, it actually has its own type, as we can uh, confirm here. So let's go ahead and comment out some of these things and see what happens. So first of all, what is, uh, what is the type pairs? So again, type is how you access what are the, what is the underlying object here that we're dealing with? What's the data type? Um, Data type of pairs is a zip object. So there's actually a whole special class of data types called zip. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, 
Let's press that and let's go ahead and see what happens. Now, here's one of the weird things. Um, again, this is a zip data type, which means that if I am going to try to print it in a way that's sort of intelligible, um, well, let's go ahead and just see what happens if I try to print pairs. Uh, so it just tells me that there is a, a zip object that exists at this sort of space in memory. Um, so we can typecast it into something we know how to print, um, like lists. So let's go ahead and use lists. Um, and indeed, this is what I said it would do. It returns a list. We have the square brackets and then a bunch of tuples, where it's the first distance, comma, the first time, the second distance, comma, the second time, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, we could have also changed this around to be uh, set. And this would replace it with curly braces, but notice the order is different. That, that 20 comma one, which was at the front of our pair of lists, um, is somewhere now over here, and now we have 17 comma six. Um, so if we really care about the order, uh, go back to lists because that has well-defined notion of a, of a subscript. All right, so let's go ahead and, and suppress this, this print. And let's go ahead and see how we would use list comprehension to compute the speeds. So remember, list comprehension involves an expression for some element in some iterable. So in this case, we could say, let's take D divided by T. It's distance divided by time. It's just going to be our shorthand for that for d comma t. So again, we're using this expression is composed of variables which are invoked at this point in our pairs. And so pairs again is going to be just some iterable objects, the zip object. So and then let's see what happens. All right, so it does exactly what we want it to. It takes 20 divided by 1, gives 20.0, and then so on and so forth. Um, all right, so that's great. So just out of curiosity, notice what happens if we <clears throat> go ahead and try to print my list of pairs. So you'll, you'll see here that it actually returns an empty list. Um, now, now let's just watch carefully. What happens if I never use it? Oops, without these two. It does exactly what it did up here, which is it returns 20 comma one, 15 divided by 15 comma three, so on and so forth. But somehow the action of using list comprehension across our lit, our zip object, um, it has the effect of sort of, I won't say unzipping, but taking everything out of this iterable to free up space and memory. Um, and this is exactly the kind of thing which, under the hood, uh, makes a big difference in memory management and all these different things for doing these operations. Um, so just be aware that if you, if you are trying to use a zip object and you use it once in a computation, um, it's not going to be uh, the same later. All right, so let's see. So that is a way you could compute the a lot of the speeds of all these different cars, these 10 cards using the zip function and list comprehension. List comprehension again uses the list and you know, we use this whole expression for some variable inside some iterable. And we just take it for granted that a zip object is an iterable. You can read more if you're curious, but right now we just want to use it. All right, so let's see how we might um, work with higher dimensional lists in Python. So, so you want to think of a list of lists as sort of providing a way of accessing sort of higher indexing higher dimensional objects. Um, so just like when we had our first example of A, we had a list where each entry in that list was another list. It printed and it looked like a matrix. A matrix you kind of think of as a 2D grid of numbers. Uh, but there's no reason we should could have stopped there. We could have actually continue to have further entries of lists of lists. Um, so let's go ahead and see how we might take the product 
of, of two lists of lists, or we might think of these as a higher, a 2D list, two-dimensional list, 2D, D is for dimension. All right, so A is going to be 2341 in a list that is the first entry in our bigger list. And then we've got minus one comma two, which is the second list, second index in this larger list, two minus four, three comma eight. All right, so bring those into memory. And so suppose we want to create a third list. Um, and right now what we're going to do is we're going to start by initializing this list, a bunch of zero entries. Um, and we're kind of using ahead of time that we know that this is going to be a 2D list, meaning it's a, uh, a list where we have entries of lists. All right, so one way we can multiply these entry by entry. Um, so again, we're going 23 times 2, 41 times minus 4, minus 1 times 3, and 2 times 8. It's going to give us 16 minus 3, minus 164, 46. Now, in order to do that, you have to do some pretty fancy footwork um, in our list. So, so we're going to have a for loop, which essentially steps through, you want to think of this kind of as the, um, uh, as the rows in our, in our matrix. And then inside of each list, we think of these sort of as giving us column entries. Um, all right, so, so how will we do that? Well, we're going to have one for loop, which steps through the i, that's our row index, and then uh, for our j, which is our column index. Uh, and then we're going to say that L3, that's which is this, at entry ij is equal to a ij times b ij. Um, and let's just go ahead and call this c, which is going to be np dot array. see all right good so let's let's again just for for our own sanity let's look at print c and let's look at print l3 okay so all right so i had it a little backwards but we, we can kind of think of this as actually uh the first row and then that second list is actually giving us uh, our sort of second row um, but if we're careful, let's go ahead and ask what's L3 at, well, 0, comma, 0 should be this entry. Now let's go look at 0, comma, 1, minus 164. All right, so again, it's, uh, it's all the same 0th row, first column. So actually, everything I said was fine. No. All right, good. And, and notice that when we print it as a list, it just sort of list wraps it out like this. But when we treat, turn it into a NumPy array and, uh, and print, it kind of stacks it to make it look like a matrix. That's one of the reasons why this is sort of NumPy is really Python's MATLAB. All right, so what's one way we could have not solved that problem? Of course, there are lots of ways, but notice that if we try to use this code, so again, we have distances, Remember is, is a list, so let me go ahead and comment this out and just ask distances, make sure it knows. All right, good. And then there's um, print distances and print names. Uh, okay, good, good, good. So now let's see what happens. We try to do speeds equals distances divided by times. All right. All right, so again, we get a type error. Um, which tells us that I'm trying to do something with this type, again, here it's a list, that is not allowed. Um, so in this case, unsupported operand type for division. That's, remember, that's the division symbol, list and list. So sounding it out, it tells us exactly what we know. We can't divide one list by another. All right, so let's, let's see where NumPy um, saves the day. All right, so just to be brief, we're going to use uh, little d as our NumPy array for distances and little t for our NumPy array of times. So let's bring that to memory. And notice that when we use d divided by t, 
now that these objects are no longer lists, but actually they're NumPy arrays, and we get the right thing. Um, and again, if you, if you just did this, there wouldn't be any output because all that does is store to this variable name speed, this object. Um, but if we go ahead and just leave the variable to be the last thing to be evaluated when we execute the code cell, then, uh, then we get exactly our times. And isn't that simple? So just think about how much that sort of saves. If you really know how to work with NumPy arrays, you can do things like divide one array by the other, and it understands what to do. All right, so similarly speaking, we just had number A and B. Those were sort of matrices or a list of lists. Um, and we had to write these two for loops, one that stepped through sort of all the row indexes and then one that stepped through all the column indexes. Um, but if we just use the asterisk operator, then it knows what to do. It knows to just multiply them entry by entry. Um, so we can divide arrays and we can also multiply arrays and it knows exactly how to multiply them. Notice this is not a matrix multiplication. Um, some might call this like a Kronecker product or something like that. All right, so let's quickly survey some of the operations we can perform with NumPy arrays. So we can do things like determine the size, the shape, the memory consumption, the data types of all these arrays. Um, we can get and set the values of these individual array elements. Um, we can get and set smaller subarrays within a larger array. Uh, we can even do, this is going to be really one of the most important things we'll do in this class, especially as we start working with real data, so we can change the shape of a given array. Uh, this is going to be one in particular which comes up a lot when we're trying to plot or apply some of these machine learning methods. We'll need to do a reshape um, just because the way in which sometimes pandas wants you to have uh, your data given to you is slightly different than how it was in the previous version. And so you might need to do a little reshape. And if you know how to read error messages, you can almost always figure it out. All right, combining multiple arrays into one and splitting one array into many. All right, so let's see some of these operations in action. So again, we've got this, uh, these two arrays. And so let's make another one. So we have L2 equals MP dot a range. So notice this is different than range. Range, this would be our start and our stop value minus one or plus one, depending how you look at it. Um, so a range is going to basically populate one of these guys. So let's, let's first look at what happens. I uh, want to look at L2. All right, so this is pretty useful. And again, it kind of gives you a sense of what happens actually with the range function. Now, of course, in Python, when you call the range function, it creates a range object, uh, which is kind of like a zip object, something you can iterate over, especially built for for loops. Uh, but in this case, we have uh, L2, an A range object, which starts at one and ends at nine, which is again, this value minus one. Exactly how a range operation works, but it goes ahead and makes it as an array. Now. Suppose we want to reshape um, this, uh, this array so that it looks more like a matrix. Um, we could just do that by specifying the number of rows and columns. Um, so let's see if we wanted to make this uh, a little bit larger. So, so notice when I tried to reshape it there, it gave an error because I now have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So let's imagine we wanted four rows and three columns. Um, and let's see what happens. All right, great. So that does exactly how you think it would in, in matrix notation. So this now creates four rows, three columns. That's one, two, three, four rows, one, two, three columns. All right, good. So let's, uh, just in case I need to use this again, um, I'm make this 13. I'm gonna go back to putting this here and I'm gonna comment out all of that. 
good. And okay, good. All right, so notice that in order to find both that one and five and that three by three array, we need to define them using lists. Particularly, we need this list of lists to find this three by three array. Um, so also, one thing you can do is, and this goes back to what I said at the very beginning, so NumPy is good for homogeneous arrays of data. Um, homogeneous means of the same type. So that can be, normally is, like a float. That means like a decimal number, an integer, can be a bunch of trues and falses, strings, or whatever object that you're interested in. Maybe you want to have an array of mortgages, just like the objects that we created in that class. You can do that. OK, so let's go ahead and do exactly what we did before. We had that array 1, but we're going to change the data type, that's d type, to be string. So, so notice we're now already seeing this syntax of a function which has default values, sort of defaults to whatever Python thinks is the most appropriate thing. But I can also hard code and force the data type to be like a string. So you'll notice that is reflected in the fact that they're quotes. That's how I know these are all strings. Um, all right. So what are some other things? So we just talked about some of the homogeneous data types, floats, ints, strings. Um, let's try to get a Boolean. So these are true or false. All right, so. so let's look at our NumPy array, which consists of this lengthy list, 235, 1625, 5, 441, 57. And so here's a very weird operation. And again, all we did with the object-oriented programming is kind of preparing you for understanding the syntax that's used here. So I'm going to define a new object, b, where b is going to be a less than 15. So that seems odd, right? I mean, how do I compare an array with a single number? Do I take the biggest entry, the smallest entry, the first entry? How would I define this? How would I make sense of what it means to invoke this operator, this comparison operator? Well, we can see what happens here is it ends up returning an array of Booleans, which asks, is that entry less than 15? And so two is less than 15, three is less than 15, five is less than 15, but 16 is not less than 15. So that gives us a false. Um, and so B is now, it knows to take this object and now sort of iterate over all these entries in the array and then return the Boolean value of its comparison. So you might want to flip this process. So instead of just knowing which entries are or are not less than 15, suppose I'm interested in sort of applying a sieve and only taking out the values that are less than 15. So we get another here sort of syntactical trick in NumPy. So, so I can define C to be A, where I use these square brackets. And then I only include the entry when that entry is less than 15. So, so this sort of almost has like a list comprehension feel. Um, indeed, what that does is it extracts out all the entries in that array that were less than 15, um, and then just stores them in the way in which that was encountered. All right. so, so just as a quick sort of take home about the difference between Python lists and NumPy arrays, so arrays support these vectorized operations, um, meaning you can say d divided by t, where d and t are vectors, arrays, those are the same essentially synonyms. Um, and it knows how to divide by going entry by entry. And same thing with multiplication. Um, but if you just try to take two lists and say in Python, I want to take this list divided by this list, we already saw that that, that gives an error. It gives a, a type error. Um, but NumPy arrays know how to, know how to divide uh, entry by entry. And you don't need to write any for loops, so it's very attractive. Um, so notice that once we create an array, you cannot change its size. Um, 
Um, now, one thing you could do is essentially do this reshape method. So, so this isn't maybe strictly true. Um, so, but um, maybe implicitly what's happening when you then reshape is you sort of create a new space in memory that is now reflecting that I've got an object that used these old array entries, but now it's in a different shape. Um, and again, the, the fact that these things are sort of, sort of written into memory in a particular way is what makes NumPy so much faster. All right, so every array has one and only one data type. That's what it means to be homogeneous. Um, equivalent NumPy array occupies much less space than a Python list of lists. Um, so you might try to think why that is the case. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and go through again what these vectorized operations look like. Um, and let's introduce some new ones. So we already did division and multiplication of two NumPy arrays. Um, but now we can do scalar multiplication, and then we can do uh, scalar multiplication and then multiplication. So, so if you remember, first let's do print A. So A consists of this 2, 5, 16, 25. This is the thing that we then compared with 15 just a few slides ago. If I take three times A, it's gonna just go ahead and take every one of those entries, multiply it by three, so it knows what to do. And then here, similarly, um, what was what was B? Ah, yes. Yeah, so B was our array of booleans, which just asked which one of these guys is actually um, uh, less than uh, fifteen, or when is the comparison operator return return fifteen? So. So let's see. Can we make a conjecture about um, what is happening there? So, so let's uh, let's try to maybe figure out why is this the case. So, uh, this, well, let's figure out. Let's do three times b. None. Yes. So you'll see essentially what happened is that it took um, my array of true and falses and then realized that when I want to start doing numerical operations like multiplication, um, I need to think of true as one and zero as false and then multiply those entries by three. So then this essentially just uh, zeroes out all the false entries and then, then multiplies all the true entries by, by three. So. All right, so let's see how we would like uh, to access some of these things. So again, just for, you know, print A, G. So notice that, you know, this is a, a sort of one-dimensional array, so meaning it's, it doesn't have further entries. or, And so if I take A2, well, that's going to take the second entry, again, with zero indexing. That's zero. This is one. This is two. And then it looks at the second entry of B, which is true. And then because I'm using a plus operator, it's turning that true into one, and then gives us six. So. This output. All right, good. And then so what happens if we try to do some, some uh, reshaping and, and accessing? Now when you have to use this sort of higher dimensional notation, we don't just give a single number, like here we gave two or one, that access the, the thing in index two or the thing in index one, which corresponds to the third position or the second position. Uh, here you have to give a whole essentially like a vector of entries because uh, we've reshaped these again this is a a three a nine entry list or array and then i reshape into a three by three matrix and i do the same thing for b and i can repeat the same operation so so i'm gonna go ahead and print b and then again we can see it so zero zero is going to give us this entry um, and then one, two, so that's going to be our 
first row. So actually it's our second row. It's our index one row. Um, and then it looks at the second indexed entry. And that actually happens to be true. And that turns into a one. So now we have one plus two is three. So that's that. All right, so now let's do some of the same things we do with lists. Um, we'll do with 1D arrays. So, so again, we use this A range function. Um, and uh, all the operations that we did before with slicing, um, where we go index one through index six. So seven minus one is six. Uh, gives us exactly what we might like. So let me go ahead and print X. Okay. All right, that's nice. So it starts at two. Let's just stop at 29. Um, uh, and in fact, if it gets to 29, it's not even gonna go there. It's gonna stop before that. So that's why it stops at 26, because 26 plus three should be 29. But again, you take that thing minus one. Um, and so that is that. And now here we're gonna slice from five to 20. All right, cool. And again, you've got our same notation for slicing, either specifying just a start point or specifying an, an end point. All right, and so multi-D arrays are very similar. Um, so again, you've got this the same sort of code where you have start, stop, step, um, where now you're sort of operating inside of this sort of rows, columns, whatever the third dimensional analog of that would be. Um, and so, so if we did that here, so this should go through the rows backwards because we have this minus one and then sort of step through this, uh, the column entries as we would normally. So again, I've already compiled, but you can see here that, so it takes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, so now it's go through the rows backwards. So that means seven, eight, nine is gonna come first, then four, five, six, then one, two, three. And that's exactly what happens here. Now, what happens if we were to, to flip this? So now I go, let's go ahead and do this. Maybe just for our own sanity, let's go ahead and print this and print this. You can see here that, all right, so we've reversed, put 789 in the, again, in the first position, but now we've marched through that backwards. So we go 987. And similarly, just as 456 was fixed, we now have 654. And then three, one, two, three being our last row now, is now step through is three, two, one. So this, again, all the operations we did before still still work here. And um, um, the more you play with this, the more you'll remember how to how to incorporate things. All right. And so again, like in many modern applications, it's very useful. Just like with this Jupyter notebook, I can make a copy um, so that I can then mess with the copy without affecting the values of the original. Um, so we already know what's happening there. Um, um, and then there are some other ways of making constant arrays. So that means that I can create an array of all ones or an array of all zeros. Um, and that does exactly as, as we think. All right, so now one of the reasons we need all of these things is you're going to eventually use these NumPy grids. Um, and in this case, I'm going to use specifically the NP A range function, which you'll notice now supports non non integer step sizes, which is something that tripped a lot of people up on some of the homework. Um, and then we can turn this into what's called a mesh grid object. And so now I can just go ahead and take this sort of sampling from minus ten to ten at steps of a quarter, um, and consider the plot of the function f of x, y equals x squared minus y squared minus 10. 
No. So again, this isn't going to look like a sphere because we have a minus sign here. No. Instead, it's going to do something that's kind of curvy. And then we can use some of these matplotlib um, libraries, which I've brought in here, um, to plot the surface. Um, and so, which you'll notice, I'll just go ahead and show it to you here. We get a saddle. Um, so again, this is one of those sort of fundamental objects um, in mathematics. So, so here you are sort of, you might also call this a mountain pass. So here you have to go up to the mountain, here you have to go up to the mountain, but here we're trying to pass between the two mountains. Um, all right, but you'll notice um, if I hit shift enter, um, sometimes the first time through, it won't actually generate this plot. You need to do it twice. Um, so that's just be warned. All right, so NumPy has plenty of built-in functions and operations, which we're gonna become familiar with uh, soon. So one way and we, do, we can do that is using the random integer, which will create a random, an array with a bunch of random integers. It's gonna be extremely useful for doing stochastic experiments. So let's go ahead and see that. Um, so again, by already bringing in NumPy into memory, by using that import NumPy as np, uh, we also have access to these random functions. So here's random.randint, um, and here's the syntax that explains uh, how these should work. So we're gonna go integers between zero and 10, um, and a one by six array. And here we're gonna use three to four, and here three, four, five, so this will be a three-dimensional array. Um, and so every time we run this, we'll get a different draw um, of the integers between zero and nine, um, and those there are no tens. Um, every time it'll generate, it'll give us something, something that might not be the same as before. Um, it's, it's a random variable now, random matrix. All right, so you can do other things like uh, look at random real numbers um, between zero to one, inclusive of zero, but exclusive of one um, of shape two, two. So this is gonna give us sort of a scatter plot of, of you might think of it as, a, as probabilities or frequencies. Um, and then you also can make those draws not from a uniform distribution, which is implicit when we say a random between, so we're using the uniform distribution. Um, here we're gonna use the normal distribution. You can do that by saying rand in. Um, and so by not passing it any other, it's gonna assume doing the, the sort of standard one with mean zero and variance one. Um, and then again, rand int was as we already said. Um, and then just a single random number, if we provide no other shape or size parameters, it's just invoked via this. Um, and so we're gonna hopefully craft a lecture where we really make use of some of these random, uh, random operations. All right. So pick 10 items from a list with equal proper probability. So here we can uh, specify a list um, of things we wanna choose from. Um, you can do, and then we can also set a probability vector. Um, so for example, suppose we want a random vowel, but we know that some vowels are more likely than others. Um, then you can specify whatever the probability distribution is. All right, so, so notice that whenever we ran through that iteration, it gave me a different array. Um, so one thing we can do to set our randomness, because there really is no true randomness, only pseudo randomness, um, is we can specify what seed is being used. Um, and this is gonna be very, very useful when we start doing uh, some of these machine learning algorithms, which make some probabilistic choice. Um, so let's go ahead and set my random seed to be zero. And notice every time I run this, I get, same array. And if I were to change it, I can make this another number. Fine. Now with that seed, it's going to give me the same output. This is going to be very useful if we're trying to compare people's probability experiments. Where, uh, you know, fundamentally, it's supposed to be a random thing, but we can 
specify which sort of random path we took um, by specifying the C. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, I look forward to seeing you all in class.